too complicated. It's one of the reasons many researchers don't want to touch serotonin 100%. Yeah. Um, but now, is there, I guess, a difference in the three-dimensional conformational change that occurs when uh, uh, the neurotransmitter, for example, or in this case, LSD, the drug, the compound, binds to the serotonin receptor uh, in the sense that it changes in a different way for... Uh, intracellular cascade molecularly to take shape mm -hmm. uh, or yeah, like totally. relative to other psychedelics would, would the change be different at all so the, the the basic idea is if you if you read that paper is that like your endogenous ligand so the drug that your body synthesizes to bind to serotonin receptor is serotonin um right so mm -hmm. basically when serotonin binds you know normally will bind to the receptor and then after any after any drug binds to a you know a site on a G protein coupled receptor, the top of the receptor kind of closes, and the bottom of the receptor opens, kind of like if I take my hands and just do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And when the bottom of a receptor opens, the um, like there are signaling molecules. One of them is beta arrestin. Uh, it comes in and binds up inside the receptor in the bottom. But what's interesting, I guess. Where's it going with this? But what's interesting, I guess, with all this um, is that when you activate most G protein coupled receptors, um, there's a thing, there's this thing called an ionic lock that kind of breaks. It kind of breaks and allows the bottom of the receptor to open. And what you notice with a lot of or any psychedelic is that they are beta arrestin bias, meaning that like more, meaning that the beta arrestin that's going to come up and bind in the bottom of the receptor. Is going to fit better than something like G, uh, like G alpha or G beta, or I guess you could say secondary messenger pathway. It's going to be beta arrestin bias because beta arrestin is coupling to it more than other um, secondary um, pathway messengers. Yeah. Beta arrestin would uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it would I guess inhibit camp binding or cyclic AMP, which is one of the powerhouses of the cell. It's like an excitatory intracellular right. compound. So that is right. do you know what receptor sorry, what neurons or cell types these uh, GPCRs typically reside on if they're excitatory, like glutamatergic or inhibitory GABAergic, because then you could end up, you know, with an inhibit in a grand inhibition at the end of the day or a disinhibition, which actually leads to that excitation down the line, right? I just know that it inhibit it does it does seem to inhibit uh, cyclic AMP, but I don't know overall what cell type it, it resides on. Last week, Paul, you weren't here for the conversation last week. I don't think I don't remember. But uh, there was a paper that we went over in terms of how psilocybin causes ego death, the mechanism behind that. And they essentially went through how it's a 5-HT1A, sorry, 5-HT2A dependent mechanism. And they relate to and they cite different articles that go down this line of thought, but that at the based on the chain of events that occurs from the cortical 5-HT2A agonism, if you wind up with a negative psychological experience during your trip, you're more likely to have a hyper excitatory or, a, you know, a hyper excited uh, glutamatergic output within the cortical uh, regions. Whereas if you have a relaxed and holistic or happy uh, positive psychological experience during your trip, it's more in terms, uh, it can be correlated to a decrease or an inhibition of cortical activity. Okay, so that come, that's why you were asking the question about cell types. Yes, yes, it's yeah. trying to bring it back to some kind of mechanism here into how we can like, you know, put it back into the behavior itself. Yep. Mm. Interesting. Do you have any uh, perspective on that potentially, Asher? I do not. The biggest thing I guess I know is like I, I'm not much of a behavioral person, um, but the, the biggest stuff in terms of like the mechanism of action of LSD, um, I think for me, like the easiest stuff to understand is the default mode network stuff that comes from the Carr Harris group. I don't know if I sent you anything default mode network oriented. Uh, that was from the Royal Society paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe that one. But that what you what you... What you essentially, I can wait for you to pull it up. Yeah, yeah. got it's it fine. up now. But what you essentially see is there's brain regions or subcortical structures called default mode networks. Um, and their function is to, you know, allow a person to be able to have normal physiological functions. 
So if you, the way to think about these for me is like think about big transit stops. You know, if you go to a big city, you have like 10 different buses and maybe like a train in that goes to Toronto, right? And then if you go to maybe like, I don't know, Winnipeg or Saskatoon or another decently sized city, you might have another one of these big transit stops. So if you think about the fact that you might have like three transit stops, transit stop A, B, and C, and transit stop A can communicate with B, and B can communicate with C, but transit stops A and C can't communicate. What seems to happen when you take psychedelics is that you disinhibit this neural network from working such so that transit stop A can now communicate with C. It does seem to allow for like a much larger global um, connectivity in these um, default mode networks. Okay. Is, is, does this have any relation to, uh, I remember seeing, I, I don't think I read the actual manuscript for the study, but there was a lot of it in the news a few years back where when you take psychedelics, and I think David Nutt was involved in this study, I'm not sure about Robert Carthart Harris, your brain connectivity or the regions that become connected, they haven't been connected since infancy, or it allows for connections between brain regions that haven't been in connection or coordination since since very very early on in life is there any i guess like do you, is that what you were speaking yeah. to yeah i mean like if you kind of think about the thinking about it more just from like i guess like a cycle walks around a child is fascinated by everything right a child just like looking at like plants and trees and water and it doesn't really it doesn't really have any of these its neural networks aren't as formed yet so it has this very loose connectivity between brain regions, a more expansive region, because it hasn't learned stuff. But I guess as you get older and you learn things, your neural networks become stronger and more integrated. They become like if you know if you're an adult and you've been, I don't know, maybe you have some sort of trauma, right? And you've experienced um, this trauma where whenever you see like. A, phys a, a visual cue, you get scared. Like you see like, I don't know, like a baseball bat or like a belt and you get scared or something. Um, these neural networks seem to just disintegrate when you take psychedelics. But I would imagine it'd be cool to see like a study where they do an fMRI of like a baby's brain versus somebody sober and somebody on a psychedelic. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, because I, I, would, I, would, I would ask the question, how would they have defined that or how would they have gotten to that conclusion? have i'm sure it's possible to do fmri studies and you know connectivity studies on babies probably a little more difficult yeah. with having them stay still in that yeah. sense but this whole default mode network that you speak to with the you know bus stop a bus stop b and bus stop c there's there's this typical i guess structure that the brain is organized within that has been built up over time and i guess you know probably evolution contributes to this the as we are developing in the womb, there is a genetic blueprint that our cells uh, go through in order to form the same brain structure in every human being, like very similar with very, very minor variations. As time goes on, maybe the, the genetics continue to refine those structures. We go through the, you know, the cell death or the signaled cell death, that apoptosis or the, yeah, in order to refine those networks. It, is it because like as a child you see the world differently or you're not as you know limited by those structures and that's the phase or the the end point your brain is reverted back to under the influence of psychedelics yeah i think so that's that seems to way that seems to be the way i mean it, it it happens if you observe like any small child right they're not really thinking about like oh what am i going to eat for lunch not thinking about consequences they're just like purely experiencing everything it's true <laughs> but as you get older, you, round, you kind of drown out a lot of that stuff because you learn, right? You learn information. I mean, you essentially shut off all, all the outside noise, but a baby is experiencing like everything. And similarly, when you take a psychedelic, this is what happens, right? You have this like childlike experiences that you are just experiencing everything, which is caused by the, like they call them um, a network. They call them failures when you start to like disintegrate. Um, you have all these hub failures, which leads to this global increased, in, uh, increased uh, connectivity between brain regions that normally are just like, you know, not being able to connect with one another. It's like if you, um, it's like if you imagine like a ski slope, and you know, people go down these ski trails, and the trails are all the trails are always formed in the same way. Now imagine like a fresh coat of snow going over. It's kind of like that. 
you don't necessarily have a way down. You're going to take any way down. You can go to get there. Cool. 100%. And I, and I think that, you know, kind of speaks to the actual experiences that people have when they're under the influence of these drugs, where they see the world differently. They're, they're, they look at a blank wall or just something that they've seen every single day, the same way. And they say, Whoa, I, I'm noticing something that I've never noticed about this before. Mm, definitely.